Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I'm a nurse practitioner. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. I'm happy to have you here as always. So much of the content that I create here on this channel is educational, not only for the licensed nurse practitioner, but of course, nurse practitioner students as well. And you may know that I've completed multiple different nurse practitioner boards of views in the past, some on YouTube here, and I've also collaborated with a company called Archer. And I've just taken to my review material once more, and I'm just revamping it again, finding new ways to deliver the content. So this time, I'm delivering part of it here on YouTube, and then also the complete review is available on my Patreon. So for today's lecture, I'm gonna be talking all about the pediatric population for both the AANP and the ANCC exam. This one, I just feel like this has got a lot of really good information in it. Just keep hearing from so many test takers that they had a lot of pediatric questions on there. So definitely an important topic and we have lots to go over. It is a shortened version here on YouTube to access the complete video and the complete audio files for that nurse practitioner licensing exam. Then follow the link in the description box below and that will take you to my Patreon. The total review course, it launches on February 27th, just two days away, I'm so excited, and in which case then you would pay a monthly access fee. So please, of course, enjoy this video here. It's free and it's there to help you study, access the complete audio files, make sure to become a patron and join the tier titled ANCC and AANP exam prep course. Again, the complete course doesn't launch until February 27th, but that's like two days away, so it's like right around the corner. I just wanted to make sure to give you guys lots of sneak peeks of the information to come. So yeah, without further delay, let's get into the pediatric population for the nurse practitioner licensing exam. All right, so before we get into the content, I just wanna tell you the way that I'm gonna divide up this lecture. So I'm gonna do it system-based, just like how I've been doing my content previously, this time, though, it's going to be all in one presentation, and it's only in relation to the pediatric population. So we're going to just go by system. First thing, though, I'm going to talk about a few facts regarding weight gain in infancy. Definitely see a question on this. It's important for your board's exam, so we'll just cover this now. So term neonates, those that are born at term, they can lose up to 10% of their birth weight in just the first few days of their life. However, they do typically regain and reach their birth weight by two weeks of age. Also, generally, infants should double their birth weight by four to six months. There's a little bit of a range there. You can see both numbers, but generally by four to six months, they should have doubled their birth weight, and then by one year of age, they should triple their birth weight. Also, there's some milestones here for normal development, and I would definitely review these as well because you'll probably see a question or two on these as well. So by four months of age, infants begin cooing. By six months, everything is going into their mouth. Uh, they begin tripod sitting if they're positioned. By nine months, they can transfer objects between their hands. 12 months, they should say one to two words in addition to mama and dada. And they also develop their pincer grasp at 12 months. At 15 months, they should be able to take a few steps on their own. 18 months, they can point, and they point a lot to essentially everything. Um, they can also walk independently at 18 months, and they also attempt to use a spoon at 18 months as well. And then at 24 months, they become aware of others' emotions. They can put at least two words together and they can kick a ball. So those are some big ones. I've definitely seen a lot of questions with those ones. There are lots of other milestones there. You can review those, I encourage you to. And otherwise, we're gonna get now into the system content. All right, so first up for the systems is going to be the musculoskeletal system. And we're gonna talk about a couple of important points with this for the pediatric population. So we're gonna talk about scoliosis and osgood schlatter disease first, and then we'll talk about some important stuff regarding fractures in the pediatric population. So adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. This is the most common type of scoliosis and it occurs after 10 years of age. And what it does is it causes a lateral curvature of the spine. So symptoms of this would include uneven shoulder height and an asymmetrical appearing waist. You could have your patient bend forward and touch their toes and they need to make their back as parallel to the ground as possible. And while standing behind them, you're assessing them uh, and you're observing for asymmetry. 
Diagnosis though, so it's pretty easy to pick out on clinical exam when evaluating, but diagnosis confirmed with radiographs. So criteria that indicates the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is onset of 10 years or older, and then more than 10 degree Cobb angle. And this is just measuring of that curvature spine. Osgood Schlatter disease, this is also referred to as osteochondritis of the tibial tubercle. It basically occurs from overuse. It's a repetitive use or overuse injury. It's generally seen in children and adolescents. Also, children that have had a rapid growth spurt recently, they're going to be at an increased risk for experiencing Osgood Schlatter's disease. Uh, symptoms would be anterior knee pain. It's exacerbated with trauma or use, and it's relieved with rust. Diagnosis, it's made on exam with tenderness at that bony prominence. Treatment is very conservative, icing, rest. They can do NSAIDs for short-term pain relief. There's no return to sports restrictions with this if they're able to tolerate continued activity or play, and then just do that symptomatic treatment as needed. Typically, though, the symptoms of osgood schlatter disease resolve once the growth plate ossifies. All right, and let's talk a little bit about pediatric fractures. So children, they exhibit unique fractures because of the compressibility of their bone, the increased fibrous strength, and then the presence, of course, of the growth plates as well. So examples of fractures that are unique to the pediatric population include a buckle fracture, green stick fracture, a bowing fracture, and or a Salter Harris fracture. And we're gonna cover those on the slide here now. So a buckle fracture, this occurs after a compression injury, and they typically occur in the distal radius after a FUSH injury. And if you remember, FUSH stands for falling on outstretched hand. So buckle fractures, these are considered stable. They're managed with splinting and then a one-time follow-up. So this is considered a stable fracture. And then a green stick fracture, this describes a bone that is bent with a fracture line, but it does not completely extend through that width of the bone. The green stick fracture, though, is at a high risk for repeat fracture, so it does require splinting followed by casting within a few days of the injury. A bowing fracture, so this occurs when the, there's a longitudinal force on the shaft of the bone, and it exceeds the bone's ability to recoil back to that normal position, and it leads to curvature of that bone, or bowing of the bone, hence the term bowing fracture. The curvature, this is actually indicative of lots of microscopic fractures, and these type of fractures, they typically affect the ulna, the radius, occasionally the fibula as well. If the curvature is less than 20 degrees, or if this injury occurs in children that are less than four years of age, they generally just resolve spontaneously. However, in circumstances where this isn't the case, or if you're not sure of the degree of curvature, then these should be urgently referred to an orthopedic because there is a concern for improper healing. The Salter-Harris classification system, so this grades physial fractures or growth plate fractures, and it grades it one through five. So the severity of the injury to the growth plate, it increases as that Salter-Harris grade increases, and then complications it could include growth arrest, permanent decreased range of motion, deformity, and so it's really important to properly identify these types of fractures in this population. So the word SALTER, it's an acronym, and it helps to define where the fracture lies in respect to the growth plate. So S stands for type 1, it's straight across the growth plate. A is type 2, it's above the growth plate. L is type 3, it's lower or below the growth plate. T is type 4, it's through the growth plate. And then ER is together, it's type 5, and that's erasure or crush of that growth plate. It's important to note, too, that some pediatric fractures aren't seen on that initial plane imaging, and they do often require a clinical diagnosis and then follow-up imaging. And so that's why always in practice we say, when in doubt, splint. It's better to err on the side of caution and splint them than to not splint them and have a worsening injury. Uh, another important point too is that providers, they need to be cognizant of injuries that could indicate child abuse. So there's a couple of fracture patterns that we see 
in cases of child abuse and so we obviously want to have our eyes out for this type of injury. So examples of fracture patterns in pediatrics that suggest abuse include long bone fractures in non-mobile patients, rib fractures, bilateral long bone fractures, fractures to the sternum, scapula, or spinous processes, or multiple fractures in various stages of healing. Those are definitely injuries that you want to be on alert for. They indicate child abuse, and in, in the circumstances, if you do come across that, you would alert the proper authorities. All right, so next up, let's talk about a few gastrointestinal diagnoses that you need to be familiar with, specific, of course, to the peds population. So first, let's talk about pyloric stenosis. So this occurs due to hypertrophy or enlargement of the pyloric sphincter, and it causes an obstruction. If pyloric stenosis occurs, it does so between the ages of three and six weeks old. These patients, they present with symptoms of projectile non-bilious, so non-bile, vomiting. It occurs immediately after being fed, so they're vomiting up what they just ate a moment later. So following this generally is a fussy, hungry baby because they just vomited up all of their food. If untreated, these patients can experience weight loss and dehydration. And if you ever sus suspect dehydration in an infant, this is an indication for an emergent ER referral. So signs that an infant might be suffering from dehydration or hypovolemia, so decreased urinary output, lethargy, irritability, tachycardia, tachypnea, or abnormal breathing, decreased skin trigger or a capillary refill of greater than three seconds. Those are all really big red flags. If you see any of those in an infant, that should prompt a uh, transfer to the emergency room. Um, specific to pyloric stenosis too, when examining the patient, you might be able to palpate an olive-shaped mass in the right upper quadrant, and it's easier to feel immediately after the infant vomits. So in the circumstance that the, vo the child vomits while examining them, you can try and palpate for that olive shaped mass. Diagnosis of this though, it's confirmed using ultrasound and they're referred for surgical correction. Gastroesophageal reflux, this commonly occurs in otherwise healthy infants. So these patients, they present with symptoms of effortless regurgitation and it typically resolves over the child's first year of life. It's very conservatively managed, just educating the patient or the caregivers that they should have that child stay upright after feedings and avoid tobacco smoke because that's shown to exacerbate it. Though we should always be educating that they need to be avoiding smoking around the infant, but this is shown to exacerbate gastroesophageal reflux. Warning signs with this includes bilious vomiting now, so that's bile in the vomit, hematoemesis, so blood in the vomit, forceful vomiting. If the onset is after six months of age, if they have abdominal tenderness to palpation, or if they have abdominal distension, all of those are warning signs. They definitely indicate that you need to have a further evaluation. Um, another important point is that sometimes a sensitivity to cow's milk protein mimics gastroesophageal reflux. And so the parents can trial removing this from the diet and see if their symptoms improve. Uh, other symptoms of cow's milk protein intolerance would be occult blood in the stool, eczema, and poor weight gain. All right, and let's talk a little bit about intussusception. So intussusception, this occurs when the intestine, it telescopes in on itself and it causes sudden intermittent severe abdominal cramping. This most commonly occurs in patients between six months and 36 months old. And the patients, they typically present with inconsolable crying, frequent drying up of their legs towards the abdomen. That's very textbook. So the current jelly stool, this is actually a late finding. It's actually seen also in a minority of patients. But again, that's the textbook definition of intussusception. Also with these patients on exam, you might be able to palpate a sausage-shaped abdominal mass on the right side of the abdomen. This is of course compared to the olive-shaped mass in that right upper quadrant that you can sometimes palpate with pyloric stenosis. However, the diagnosis of intussusception is confirmed with ultrasound and the report may show a coiled spring appearance. These patients, they're managed in the hospital setting. If they're stable, 
expert clinicians, people that are trained very highly in this, um, they can majority of the time actually reduce this without surgery. Um, but if they're, they're unstable, then a lot of times it is a surgical correction. Mm -hmm.